Fabian Schaar is Professor for Distributed Ledger Tech and FinTech at the University of Basel. He has a PhD in crypto, co-authored the best-selling book Bitcoin Blockchain and Crypto Assets, published by MIT Press, and has published many academic papers, including one on DeFi on the St. Louis Federal Reserve Review. He's an encyclopedia of blockchain-based information and a forward-thinking voice amid academics and regulators. So what's Fabian's journey been like? Well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great honor to be here. I'm a big fan of you and the show. Yeah. And uh, it's great to have this uh, conversation. And yes, uh, we, we met recently at the BIS uh, Swiss National Bank Conference. But you forgot to mention one fact. It was a DeFi conference. I think that's True. super exciting True. that the uh, <laughs> central banks are hosting a DeFi conference. That's something that certainly wouldn't have happened just a few years back, right? Absolutely. So, uh, about me, um, I'm based in Switzerland, Basel, professor at the University of Basel, uh, researching public blockchains. Uh, the word public is super important to me because I'm not interested in any of the enterprise uh, solutions. In many cases, these are just glorified databases. So I'm mainly focused on uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum and uh, within Ethereum on decentralized finance protocols. And I have a background in economics, monetary economics, uh, game theory. Mm, then during my PhD, which I did on crypto assets, I felt a little more like, a, well, just equally as much as a computer scientist and as an economist, and I really looked into the protocols and what's going on in the space. Uh, you mentioned the book, um, which was a part of my uh, PhD thesis, it was later published by MIT Press, and uh, several papers in, in various journals, uh, also some on uh, decentralized finance. Awesome. But but what, what got you interested in crypto? Like, were you, did you go into kind of academia thinking about a distributed ledger tech or um, did you go about it kind of from, from a different angle and, and finally get to Bitcoin or how did that happen? You know, I've, I've always been interested in, in monetary economics, but also... <laughs> In, in, in the nerdy stuff. So I was huge <laughs> into gaming, for example. Mm -hmm. And then when you come with these two different backgrounds, so you know, on the one hand, you, you teach yourself programming and you're interested in that stuff, but also have a background in, in monetary economics. It was like a, a logical step at some point, but it didn't start that smooth. I mean, initially when I got introduced to Bitcoin, it was relatively early. Uh, it's pretty much the same story as with everyone. You start looking into it and you think it's a scam and it's, it's not going to work, right? And then you look into the math and uh, how, how it works, you get more and more excited. So it's the usual going down to rabbit hole story. Mm -hmm. um, with Ethereum, I, I, it's pretty much the same. I, um, with Ethereum, was there from right the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, initially also, uh, to be honest, I, I thought it's not going to work and <laughs> it's going to be a scam. And uh, I was super excited when I started to realize what it's capable of, mm -hmm. and uh, especially in, in financial applications. Nice, nice. Um, and and then I'm interested in um, in hearing kind of how you explain these these concepts. Maybe just narrowing it down to to DeFi and Web three. Mm. Um, how you explain these concepts to you know people who are not experts, like as, as a professor um, and someone kind of you know, looking into kind of the, uh, mm. the regulatory space, like you, I'm sure you, you meet kind of the, uh, the, this audience very, very frequently. So how do you yeah. like go about describing this uh, new weird space? You know, when I talk to students, I usually have uh, an entire class, right? That's 25 hours plus where I can talk about these things. And then you have some time to go into, to cover it in quite some detail and really look in foundations, crypt cryptography and networks and consensus protocols. But obviously you don't have that time when you talk to regulators <laughs> or to uh, commercial banks. And there I take great care that I talk about self-custody. I think that's the most important aspect that you really, you can store these assets yourself. You can issue the transactions yourself. You can validate yourself. You don't have to trust anyone. And in many cases, regulators just get 
focused on other elements, but not necessarily on this aspect. They don't realize necessarily the power uh, this aspect has, that you have the option uh, to safe keep these assets yourself, that you don't have to rely on a custodian. That's something I take great care that I, I always explain that, even if it's just a relatively high level, uh, that they understand the benefits this can have. When you think about, I mean, when you think of commercial banking, um, Right now, uh, I should say, when you think about people, uh, the only option they have to, to own risk-free money without any counterparty risk, it's not risk-free, I shouldn't say that, but without any counterparty risk from commercial banks is basically cash, right? Hmm. And that's something that's going to disappear at some point. I mean, it's we don't know when exactly, but cash will go away at some point. And uh, when cash goes away, we would be in a ridiculous situation uh, where people could not hold legal tender anymore. So we have to look for alternatives, right? That they have can have self-custody and they, they are not forced to go to a commercial bank. And that to me is crypto. It's it's part of crypto, right? And it's obviously not limited to the monetary aspect, but just the entire idea that you don't have to trust anyone, that you can keep it, store it for yourself and you don't have to go to a service provider. That's extremely powerful and that's amazing. Um. And so speaking about kind of how um, policymakers and, and regulators and, and banks uh, look at this space, um, I we didn't get a, a chance to really speak after uh, the conference. And I, I'd love to hear your takes uh, on kind of what was discussed there. Mm. It wasn't too much of a surprise, to be honest, because I talk a lot to regulators all around the world about DeFi specifically. And um, the good thing is uh, they are starting to look into it. Uh, I think that's something we should appreciate to some mm -hmm. extent. And and uh, some of the regulators, they really try to understand the technology. Unfortunately, that's not true for everyone. And in some cases, they just try to apply old rules to a completely new technology that might actually solve some of the issues they, that the regulation was for in the beginning in the first place. And that's um, super exhausting and annoying uh, to some extent. I mean, uh, even uh, at the BIS, and again, I, I want to say I, I think it's great that they organized this conference and there are a lot of people who really try to look into this technology and are legitimately excited about it. But even there at the conference, you had some people that completely confused, for example, Uniswap, the protocol, with just a UI, a user interface. And then they had claims that, you know, Uniswap, the protocol, controls the tokens and they can just uh, delist tokens, which is completely untrue. And I think that's extremely dangerous when you have these statements on, on panels or in front of regulators and that's, that's something that happens all the time, uh, then people think that's true, right? And that these, these, these things, they get stuck. And so part of, of my role when I... Uh, when I'm there as, as either giving a talk or as, as an expert witness in some of these uh, calls is to make sure that these mistakes don't happen and that people really differentiate uh, not just between protocols and front ends, but also between two other things which are super important to me. And that's true decentralization, so true DeFi and fake decentralization. Because, uh, I mean, even as... Uh, as someone who is extremely exciting about the excited about DeFi, I mean, we have to admit that uh, unfortunately some of the protocols in the space really are not that decentralized, right? And have a lot of dependencies. Uh, and in in some cases, I think they deserve to be regulated uh, when when they are de facto custodians. But that doesn't mean that there aren't any protocols which are completely decentralized. And I think that's something regulators and policymakers have to get comfortable with. For sure. Um... So, and and kind of on on the 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 kind of focus itself uh, of the conference, um, I'm wondering kind of uh, what you're seeing on that that's happening in the end, kind of in, in the CBDC yeah. space. Like what I got is that um, there there isn't really anything kind of blockchain related happening or 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 planned. It's just you know like. Central banks are planning to have uh, digital currencies. And most of the time, it's not going to be um, consumer or retail facing. It'll mm. be used kind of on on the the, the back end between feder like central banks and um, and commercial banks to make transactions more efficient. But there's nothing 
you know, it, it will be kind of like digital currencies in a centralized database, nothing to do with crypto or blockchain. That's kind of the sense I got. Do you agree? Oh, absolutely. Do you think? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, honestly, there is nothing less exciting than a, a wholesale CBDC, right? It's mm -hmm. just a settlement infrastructure between some institutions. I mean, I mean, they will call it blockchain in some case, but at the end of the day, it's just a regular database between these institutions. It's not public. You cannot verify anything. You cannot even participate as a, as a retail customer. But then there are some countries uh, which have launched or are planning to launch a, a retail CBDC as an entirely different focus. Uh, that's really for the general public as a as a well, uh, substitute essentially for, for cash, right? Where you can have it as digital cash. But even there, in these cases, it's not blockchain as you and me know it, right? They might call it blockchain, but it has nothing to do, again, with a public approach. It's nothing to do with immutability or with withholding. Well, in some cases, you have your own keys, but certainly someone can change or intervene, right? Mm. And that's just a completely different approach. And uh, yeah, I, I think you're right. We also saw that at the conference again, um, as a, uh, for, for those who might not know, the topic for the conference was, does safe DeFi require CBDC? And uh, actually, uh, at the uh, opening talk, and I a little bit made fun of the, uh, of the of this question, because when you, when you think about it, I mean, the question, the conference question, does safe DeFi require CBDC is like asking, does safe decentralization require centralization? And that's an absolute no. I mean, that's kind of obvious. Yeah. Uh, I think what we got from the conference is um, that there is some room for um, something that could be mutually beneficial. Uh, mm -hmm. Because when you look at the current state of DeFi, there is a huge demand for off-chain collateralized stable coins like USDC, and they certainly have some dependencies. They certainly have some counterparty risk, and then they are US dollar denominated. So I don't see why there wouldn't be a demand for a CBDC issued on the public chain. This could be a benefit to DeFi when you, when you mm -hmm. come from that angle. On the other hand, when you look at CBDC, they can issue it on their own private chain, but then you would lose things like composability mm -hmm. because when there's nothing else running on that private chain, then it's nice that they have their CBDC on there, but then there's not too much to do. So I think there it actually would be mutually beneficial. And I think we might see a future where some central bank might test the waters on issuing a CBDC on the public chain. In 2021, Ethereum traders lost over $240 million to malicious bots exploiting their trades. Eden Network is a next-generation private transaction service for Ethereum, providing traders with MEV protection by submitting transactions directly to miners and away from the prying eyes of harmful bots. Eden Network recently launched Eden Rocket RPC, which compiles some of Ethereum's fastest private transaction networks. Join and get started now at rpc.edennetwork.io. Policymakers and regulators around the world are making moves into crypto. It's a delicate high wire act we're walking when looking at CBDCs and government interference. But what does it all mean? Are governments about to launch blockchain based currencies without other alternatives? And how does Fabian feel when looking at this potential future? I completely agree. I'm kind of scared of the future. I think it's quite dystopian uh, mm -hmm. when you think about it. And, and you know, the, the problem with and I, I think it is a problem with, with many policymakers and regulators around the world, or just gover government institutions, uh, is that they have some flawed assumptions in many cases. They they, they always assume that the uh, um, common people um, might have bad intentions and that they try to cheat and mm -hmm. you know money laundering and terrorist financing, and then we need all of these uh, regulations. But one thing they entirely miss in their picture is that there are also bad actors in the government. And even when you're trusting your institutions right now, when you're establishing something like a CBDC, uh, when you have a heavily centralized database where a currency is running on, where you basically can expropriate people, where you can freeze funds, uh, when you even have tokens on that CBDC chain, where pretty much any assets can be frozen or um, even smart contracts, let's say, that's a, a extremely dangerous 
dangerous infrastructure. Human history is cyclical to some extent, right? And Mm -hmm. even if you trust your institutions right now, at some point there will be somebody raising or claiming power uh, which has a a malintent and might might misbehave and use this technology to get rid of political opponents. Uh, And that's that's just something that's extremely scary. And public blockchains, uh, I think, are... uh, pretty good counter instrument uh, against this development. And that's why, why I think it's super important also from a societal perspective to embrace public blockchains. For sure. And uh, I don't, I, I saw a recent report on how um, uh, the world is becoming less free. Uh, it, it was a, a pretty, pretty scary to see, you know, uh, me- measuring um Uh, free, like different types of freedoms per country. You you have uh, places like like Russia and China, who are 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 increasingly uh, oppressing um, and, and limiting freedoms uh, of of their their people. I mean, you're seeing uh, right now China's response to uh, to the pandemic. Um, yesterday, I I met with. Um, with uh, investors who are uh, based in China, but they're they're traveling, um, and they they showed me videos of these almost like concentration camps where they are keeping uh, uh, people who have tested positive uh, for for COVID. So uh, people kind of are completely helpless uh, when a government uh, turns authoritarian. Um, and yeah, you're, you're saying kind of eliminating. Um, Uh, enemies, you know, like Russia is like what, what like the best example uh, for that, I, I think. So, yeah, I, I think we it's it's not like such a um, kind of far fetched, far off future, mm. I think, where people might need a public blockchain as an alternative like it's happening right now. Yeah, and I think there are also good historic examples for that, right? It's just a really bad idea when you concentrate power just in the hands of a few institutions. Mm -hmm. I always say, uh, you know, even if, 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 even if you have a completely decentralized foundation, right? At the end, it might be the case that most people simply don't care about it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They, they might still go to a custodian. They might still go to a commercial bank. And that's perfectly fine. You don't have to force anyone to take care of their own keys if they don't want to. But what's important is with public blockchains, when the foundation is decentralized, then they have an option. They can choose. They can either choose to go with a service provider or they can do it themselves. And that's something that's important. Whereas when you go with a permissioned ledger and when you don't give people options, they are forced into a system and they don't have any outside options. And that's when things get really dangerous. Mm. Uh, also, from an economics perspective, it's a really bad idea because that's how you create monopolies. That's how you create inefficient markets and so on. And so I, I, I don't see any reason whatsoever uh, why we shouldn't embrace public blockchains. I think it's a it's a fantastic development and uh, something uh, that, that's going to help us as a society for sure. And what do you think about the, the rise of all these um, competing layer one uh, chains? Mm. Um, that, you know, you have things like Bitcoin and Ethereum, uh, which I think most people can agree on are the most decentralized layer ones. Um, but then because decentralization includes often kind of this trade-off with throughput there's been all these other layer one chains that are more or you know or some are more kind of decentralized than others uh, Hmm. but but there is kind of that uh, that trade-off um but at the same time they they are gaining a lot of traction because they are delivering the the kind of experience that users have come to expect from Kind of this information age where everything is is instant. Mm. So, um, I mean, do you see kind of a, a, a risk there of uh, this new blockchain future being um, kind of um, limited uh, in in its decentralization potential uh, because of uh, maybe these other layer ones that are less uh, decentralized gain traction. Or like, what are your thoughts there? I think it's great that we have all of these experiments. And uh, I, I think it's great to see that there's some competition as well. Uh, that being said, uh, there are a lot of blockchains which are 
heavily centralized or more centralized than they may appear at first glance. Uh, to me, one of the most fundamental questions I like to ask when I look at a blockchain, whether it's decentralized, is can I validate the transactions just with a simple computer uh, consumer uh, PC or do I require a special hardware? Um, in some cases with these um, competitors, Ethereum competitors, it's the case that you cannot validate the transactions um, because you, you you don't have the necessary hardware. In some cases, uh, mempool is not even publicly observable. And there are just all of these all of these drawbacks. Um, is that necessarily a bad thing? No, it's just it's different. Uh, personally, I... I think it's super important that the base layer is completely decentralized, but there might be different uh, preferences. And so competition is a good thing. Mm-hmm. Where I draw a line and where I think we have to be really careful is with fake decentralization again. I don't necessarily uh, have an issue when, when there are um, competing protocols and some which are more, more centralized as long as it's disclosed as long as it's clear. Uh, unfortunately, in some cases, and this is true for blockchains as well as for uh, DeFi protocols, it's not entirely clear just how centralized it actually is. Mm. And that might be a case where I think uh, regulators have to step in at some point because um, when, you, when you think of the DeFi stack and the paper you've mentioned, um, when we start with the settlement layers or the actual blockchain, when the blockchain itself is heavily centralized, it doesn't really matter what you build on top of it. <laughs> Even if the DeFi protocols are completely decentralized, when there is some entity you can just roll back the state of the of the blockchain, it doesn't really matter. Everything you build on there will be uh, will be centralized. Similarly, on the asset layer, when you have uh, tokens uh, with some promises for delivery, some some off chain uh, collateral, for example, or when you have tokens with plus blacklisting functions, expropriation functions, uh, or admin keys where somebody can pause the token contract you name it um, then it doesn't really matter whether the protocol itself built on top of um, but where the tokens are being used is decentralized mm-hmm. somebody can always freeze the assets or claim the assets right and and so on so you really have to think in these different layers and look not just at the blockchain but on every single layer to see if something is uh, centralized yeah no that that's a great point um so so yes yeah, uh, Fake decentralization is probably one of the the biggest risks uh, in DeFi. Uh, I'd love your thoughts on what what other uh, risks uh, you're you're seeing. Um, you know, with one of the let me start with one of the issues in traditional banking. Mm-hmm. When you, when you get when you open an account, then you you get like pages and pages of uh, terms and conditions and legal contracts and. Most people just sign it, right? They they don't they don't understand it. They don't have the time to really read it, and that's something we are quite used to by now. Um, I see a similar dynamic in DeFi, not with legal documents, but with smart contracts. Mm-hmm. There's just this blind trust, and I think that's somewhat dangerous. Uh, even though I understand why this is the case. Uh, I think it's extremely dangerous and um, either we get into a situation where there is some kind of uh, quality metrics, which is extremely hard to get in a decentralized way, um, or people um, will lose even more money than they already do. I mean, Mm. there have been so many hacks all the time and that obviously is a red flag, which also uh, triggers a lot of the behavior we're currently uh, experiencing with some of the regulators when they're, when they're seeing pretty much on a daily basis that some protocol has been hacked and uh, somebody is complaining that they lost a lot of funds, uh, then this is the reaction for, from the regulators who might not necessarily really understand the space and see the inno- innovative part. They might just have a mandate to protect consumers, for example, and then obviously uh, they will start knocking on the door. When you shop for plane tickets, you probably use Kayak, Expedia, or Google Flights. So why would you limit yourself to just one exchange when you trade crypto? To make sure you're getting the best possible price, you should use a DEX aggregator like Matcha. Matcha routes your orders across all the various DeFi exchanges on Ethereum, Polygon, Avalanche, BSC, Phantom, Celo, and Optimism. With Matcha, you can make limit orders on-chain so you can set and forget your DeFi trades, and now Matcha even offers gasless trading. Head over to matcha.xyz defiant 
and connect your wallet to start smarter with matcha. It's true, like this is happening um, and I'm guilty of it because like I'm not technical. So it's like, you know, when I when I go to use a DeFi protocol, uh, I'm I don't have the skill or or the time. Um, and if if I don't, then imagine, you know, like I, I run a DeFi information platform, um, you know, when I'm just like depositing something on Aave, like I'm not looking into, you know, the contract and, and seeing kind of where, yeah. like how that interest is, is like mm-hmm. made and, and so on, like all the intricacies. Um, so a regular user will, won't do that either. Uh, so what do you think is, is a good solution for that to, you know, become like well, a, a more knowledgeable user? I mean, in a perfect world, everyone would just have the, the infinite time essentially to educate mm-hmm. themselves, right? And look into it. That's certainly not going to happen. And it's also not efficient from an economics point of view. Um, I'm not sure whether I like it. Um, but I, I have a hypothesis where we are going or in what, what direction we are heading. And I think we will see less and less people interacting with the protocols, the contracts directly. Mm. Uh, I think we will probably move towards a future uh, where there will be more and more institutions coming into the space and uh, people can just access these protocols through their online banking platforms and so on. So it's integrated. And then you have some form of quality control, which may or may not work. (laughs) Mm. Uh, But again, uh, I mean, you could say that then it's not that different than what we have today. But I I completely disagree. I think it's there is a huge difference. And the difference is that you have options, right? Again, uh, even if most people would go through a commercial bank, they always have the option to use these protocols directly, to engage with the smart contracts directly. And uh, that's a super powerful thing. Do you think that in this future, um, people would still be able to interact with DeFi in a non-custodial way? So maybe there's like some intermediary like interface Mm. that's doing uh, all the security guarantees and checks um, and provides an an interface, but that people can still access these interfaces in a non-custodial way. I hope so. I mean, that's essentially what I'm what I'm trying to fight for as well. Uh, I, from a technological point of view, from a technical point of view, absolutely. There is no reason why that should not be the case. Mm-hmm. I, I think the danger is uh, from a regulatory um, perspective that policymakers, regulators might step in and say, you know, there are these two different versions of DeFi. Um, you have True DeFi, where you have protocols which are statically deployed, no one has the control over it, but, but hence you also have no KYC and AML. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, you can use that from a technological point of view, but if you do so, then good luck getting your funds uh, with a commercial bank, for example, or exchanging mm-hmm. them. Uh, so that's essentially money uh, you are forced to hide, right? And you cannot get in circulation with commercial banks or use use something use for something in a traditional system. That would be a really, really bad decision. And the other, the other part uh, would be um, something you could refer to as uh, on-chain CFI. Mm-hmm. Uh, really, these these regulated protocols where you also have KYC contracts and whitelists uh, where the institutions connect to. Mm-hmm. Um, this will definitely happen. In some cases, we already have been witnessing that, right? With all the arc as an example. Mm-hmm. Um, but I really hope that the first part, so that the former will not disappear and that uh, regulators have to uh, understand the benefits of having these this independent infrastructure, having these open protocols, and that it's not always a bad thing when you have something running independently, that it also has a lot of beneficial properties. And that's something, I, as I said, I try, try to educate these policymakers on and uh, uh, I'm fighting for. What are the, the most common misconceptions that you're seeing and regulators have? Um, I mean, the, the the one I run into in every single meeting is the, the Uniswap example I just mm-hmm. mentioned, um, where they don't understand that there is a difference between the protocol and the user interface or the website. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, in many cases, and again, this is not true for all regulators, there are some regulators who do an excellent job and really educate themselves in the space. But unfortunately for most regulators, they, they, they don't necessarily understand even the basics 
uh, of public blockchains and smart contracts. And then they have the wildest ideas like um, taking a, a statically deployed protocol and uh, just introducing some KYC component in that and why it's important. And it's it's in some cases really, uh, um, really annoying, uh, to, to be honest. Uh, also, the misconception that they think that smart contracts are legal contracts and really, really think it's just something, uh, well, some, some legal terms you put on the blockchain, essentially. So there are lots of wild uh, things. Uh, uh, but the, again, the favorite one is the Uniswap example. <laughs> <laughs> right. So so confusing kind of the the protocol with, with the interface. Yeah. Um, what do you think regulators are scared of? decentralization right i mean and you i think you cannot blame them to some extent uh, it's giving up control and uh, something i dislike about parts of the crypto community is uh, that we have this really bad idea of 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 regulators and policymakers as as bad guys right as, as some some almost like like dictators and uh, you know the the enemies we are fighting against and yes sure there certainly are bad people with regulators as there are bad people in pretty much any profession <laughs> but it's it's certainly not all of them uh, i think most regulators uh, they, they are just really stuck in their world and they, they are stuck with their goals, right? And, and you know, their, their number one priority, um, basically the incentives they have, is to crack down on money laundering and to make sure that financial markets get transparent. And uh, so it's hard for them to, to understand some of the benefits this might also bring because they're really focused on just this one task. And, you know, is, is, is crypto being used to finance uh, terrorists or is it used by Russian oligarchs or uh, money laundering and you name it? Uh, but then again, in some cases or in most cases, they miss the bigger picture that when you look at public blockchains, that it's extremely transparent, that it's independent in the sense that it also fosters financial inclusion, that there is a lot of uh, equal, uh, that there is equal access to it, that, you know, when you have an independent protocol running, there is no custodian you have to regulate. So some of these regulations might not even be necessary. And I think these are the things we have to highlight. These are the things we have to explain, um, because essentially that's also part uh, of their goal and it, it might help uh, them to appreciate this technology and really understand what it's all about. I have seen some <laughs> really exciting transformations with some of the regulators with just a few years back. They have been the, the biggest opponents of this technology and just stated all the time that it's the biggest scam whatsoever. And, and now they are starting to grasp and understand what it's all about and why, why at least parts of it are exciting. Uh, I think that's the goal. Can you can you name examples of people no. who have like <laughs> crossed over? No, no. No? no, I cannot do that. <laughs> oh, but there are a lot of them. <laughs> that's good to hear. Um, and that's another point, maybe because that's yeah. also important to understand. You know, you have a tendency to talk about these institutions as if they are just this homogeneous group of people. Mm. But I think we should also be aware within. Every single one of these institutions, there are different people with different opinions. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, there is the one um, public, the official opinion of that institution, which will be in line with some of the opinions within that institution, but certainly not with all of them. So even if you have an institution that might seem completely against crypto and is issuing, uh, well, uh, some statements which might seem ridiculous you have to be aware that within these institutions there are people that might actually appreciate the technology might appreciate crypto and see some of the benefits maybe the goal would be to find an at least one person in each institution that can then become an advocate to the technology a sort of like an inside um, spy or not spy, but like <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't call it spy. No, but not spy. I, I, I completely agree with you. I think it's super important because um, you know, in in some cases, it really seems like we're talking a different language. Mm. I mean, you have people from the outside trying to explain the benefits. 
they may not use the right words to convince people within an institution, whereas when there is somebody from within the institution who knows the background, who knows, well, uh, the internal politics, who knows pretty much anything about the institution and, and its history, um, then this person might have a much easier job to convince the people. Uh, so I, I think you're completely right, and that's super important. And the good news is that I'm not aware of any institutions <laughs> where there is no one uh, at least interested in public uh, blockchains and uh, acknowledging some of the benefits. To sub crypto, a user has to choose among hundreds of DEXs on multiple networks, all offering different rates and fees. Do you want to avoid that hassle? Swap on one inch, a DEX aggregator that gets you the best rates than any single DEX. Enjoy the unlimited liquidity across multiple networks and top level security. Try one inch now. One of the fundamental goals of any regulator is to stop money laundering. And a public blockchain is completely transparent and immutable. Yet, we still see regulators using and trying to fit the old ways to control this. KYC AML being a prime example. But is that really the best way? Does Fabian think regulators are walking down the wrong path? Well, what I always say is regulate on and off ramps. Basically, when you when you when you go through a centralized exchange, let's say, or through a commercial bank, whenever you buy crypto, whenever you sell crypto for fiat assets, uh, then that should be absolutely regulated. Uh, because of money laundering, but also to have some uh, control for, for shock propagation, uh, for example. Um, but within the system, and you mentioned that with, with you, um, again, I come with my, my Uniswap example, um, doesn't make any sense. I mean, I've heard policymakers to suggesting that anyone swapping or providing liquidity uh, should be looked at as a contractual party and should be regulated as such and then you must have measures in place personally i think even there when you're providing liquidity let's say to uniswap and then you have some profits as long as you can show where the funds came from and you can do that because it's a public blockchain, as long as you can make the case that it's a legitimate source and you can provide the entire transaction trail uh, to your commercial bank, that's a lot more than what you usually can do within, within the financial system. I mean, uh, that's another issue I have in these talks when, when regulators make it seem as everything would be fine in traditional finance and that there is no money laundering whatsoever just because it's centralized. That's simply not true, right? I mean, public blockchains are some of the most transparent systems we have. In fact, I always say the, the number one problem of public blockchains is that they are too transparent, which is also an issue. And I think that's a big issue we have to deal with at some point. Um, but it's certainly uh, not that, 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 you, that it's a, a good technology for hiding your transactions. I mean, that's simply not true. And there is so much misinformation. I mean, especially mainstream media when you talk to journalists, but also uh, in these conversations with regulators, for some reason, the image of crypto is for bad actors and for people who are trying to hide stuff uh, got stuck in the public opinion. And that's something I hope will change soon. Um, what about um, a future where more economic activity can be done on chain and that maybe, you know, people who are using crypto for money laundering or illicit activities don't even need to use an on or, or off ramp. Um, hmm. Like how, how, how could you kind of regulate the space then? Even then, um, I mean, when you, when you're today, when you're accepting a lot of cash, let's say for, whatever service. So let's say somebody buys a car and then they, they, they pay in cash. You are subject to money laundering law. And even if it's above a certain amount, you have to ask them and make sure uh, where the money came from. If you're not doing that, then you will have a hard time using it later on, right? 
And businesses, I mean, even if you have a completely decentralized infrastructure, businesses will always be regulated. They always have to uh, file their taxes. They always have to report. Um, so there is no reason to assume why this shouldn't be the case with crypto. And I also uh, think just as most businesses will not hide their cash balances, uh, I think there is no reason to assume that most businesses will will try to hide their crypto balances. I mean, when, when it's when it's easy enough and uh, when, it's, uh, when you have a reasonable taxation system, and so on. And I think most people will actually uh, do so. So what would happen in that case, when when we assume that a lot of the uh, economic activity would be entirely on chain, is that you would just start to uh, regulate some of these businesses, which accept the crypto payments. Uh, And, you know, when we talk about money laundering, then we're not talking about $10 here or $5 there. Um, that's that's really peanuts, right? That's that's not something. That's not a, not a lot of money. Uh, in when we talk about money laundering, uh, it's rather larger amounts, and you will have a really hard time going on detected with large amounts, especially when your counterparty, the one who is accepting the crypto, has a really strong incentive to ask you where the money came from because they are well aware that otherwise they will not be able to use it, uh, because their counterparty later on will ask the same questions, right? But I think that's the future we're heading if there is a lot of activity on chain. But honestly, I don't think that's where we're going. Uh, this might be disappointing and might be highly controversial and an unpopular opinion, but I think we're heading in the opposite direction. Um, I think end users at some point will either use rollups, layer twos, or go through institutions. But I don't necessarily see a, a future. Uh, where mm, retail uh, customers or, or just ordinary users are engaging with the uh, base layer, the blockchain uh, itself. They have the option, again, and that's important, but they will not do so in most cases. But like, even if they use uh, a rollup, to me, that's still very close to interacting with um with with mainnet i mean you're just using um a scaling solution but in the end you can still kind of use these applications in a non-custodial way and and interact with with dApps in in a very similar way that that you would do on mainnet i mean the difference is that you have to kind of you know uh, go through these kind of withdrawal and bridges and like the different processes that that you need to do to like actually kind of get your funds on on mainnet but other than that i think that's that's pretty close right oh yeah absolutely right i mean there's a big difference between these two cases Mm -hmm. and i think it will be a a mix of the two right there will be some people who appreciate uh self-custodial option and they will go through these layer two solutions where they still have self-custody uh, but there will be also a lot of people who don't care about this at all, and uh, they will just go through their uh, commercial banks or whatever company that will provide these services. Um, and uh, again, I don't think we have to be we have to force self custody on people. I think there are really good reasons, and it's usually a good decision to go with a self custodial approach. But if people don't want to do that because they they don't necessarily have the the, the knowledge how to uh, secure their keys properly, it's okay if they go for service providers as long as there are options. Well, again, what I what I really dislike is when they when when we are forced into a well an infrastructure where you don't have this option. But when the when the option is there, then it's perfectly fine, and everyone should be able to decide for themselves if they want to do that themselves. So go through a service provider. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Um, if if you had a magic wand and could create your ideal uh, regulatory framework, what would that look like? Um, Completely forget about com- consumer protection. Just issue a warning. <laughs> it's it's your funds. You can do it whatever you want. You have mm-hmm. to be aware that there's some risk. I think it's absolutely ridiculous what's going on in some cases with consumer uh, protection, where uh, regulators are telling people what they can invest in and what they cannot invest in. So that would be my number one priority. And then just take a reasonable approach with, with public blockchain regulation. Um, don't... Um, don't just apply old laws and um, destroy all of the innovation. Don't create some, well, uh, random terms like 
uh, unhosted wallet, for example, which is, it's just a wallet, right? It's completely ridiculous. Um, <laughs> and, and acknowledge that there is, that the innovation is that you can have self-custody over your assets. I think that's, that's my, that's my number one uh, priority. Got it. Um, yeah, I mean, you're, when you were talking about consumer protection, I, I remembered the recent Uniswap lawsuit. Uh, I'm sure you saw that. Um, Did you look at the amounts? <laughs> oh my god! And and, and and the tokens. It's like okay, yeah. <laughs> you're you're investing in ETH Max, um, and I don't know <laughs> what else. And then complaining. Uh, I mean, I probably shouldn't laugh, right? Uh, but uh, still, I think it's it's ridiculous to be to be quite honest, um, especially because it's so obvious that it's not about the protocol, right? Even if they would succeed with that lawsuit. Um, it wouldn't change anything about Uniswap, <laughs> right? I mean, yeah, maybe uh, some of these VCs will pay some money. Uh, maybe uh, the more centralized parts of, of, of the setup of Uniswap would disappear, but the protocol would still be up and running. It wouldn't change anything. And it wouldn't change the fact that when you have a completely decentralized infrastructure, um, that there will also be some scams listed on there. Right? It's, it's not it's yeah. not it's not for them to decide and they cannot do anything about it so yeah and and also i mean when you look at the amounts um it's just it seems somewhat unreasonable when you have uh, i think it's in, in some cases 90 bucks here and then maybe mm -hmm. a few hundred bucks there when you think about what what it what it actually costs to start a lawsuit like that um it's just in no relation and uh, yeah yeah it's, it's ridiculous yeah. Yeah, um, to me, it's it's the the idea of not taking responsibility for your actions. You know, I, I think it's it, it's it's tough because it does require like an entire shift, a uh, mentality shift, both in kind of taking responsibility for your assets with self custody. Um, and with that comes taking responsibility of your Absolutely. actions, right? Like yeah. if you, if you're buying these tokens, you know, like you're, you're asking for a SEC type filing. Sure. But there's still public information out there. You know, you can still go and look at their websites, uh, and kind of look at their, the teams behind them. I mean, there's, there is public information to do your own research, um, so and I even think, if you, yeah. Even if they don't like it, I mean, the code is up and running. It's it's mm -hmm. it's when it's when you have a protocol that's statically deployed, nothing's going to change that, right? It's it's just there, and it will be running forever. Yeah. And I think that's something mm, regulators have to <clears throat> get comfortable with. Yeah. And uh, regarding the other point, I completely agree. I, I always say, you know, the best thing about crypto is that you have self custody if you really want it and, and you don't have to ask anyone for permission and you can really do whatever you want and in some cases the worst thing about crypto is that you're completely self-responsible because you have self custody right and then mm -hmm. uh, when something happens well you, there is no uh, relationship manager or somebody you can complain to it's just your own fault yeah and it's just i mean when people do that uh, when they were losing some money and then and they, they claim a protocol, a decentralized protocol, I, I don't understand that. Sparex recently launched USDS, a decentralized stablecoin that automatically generates passive income for holders. USDS is a hybrid stablecoin, part backed by cryptocurrencies and part by the protocol's ability to mint and burn the governance token SPA. The yield is generated organically via external DeFi applications, to ensure sustainability of the system. Thanks to the auto yield, it pays to hold USDS. Go to app.sparax.io and mint your own USDS today. One of Fabian's latest papers discusses a creeping complexity within the space of wrapping and rewrapping tokens on chain. In 2018, pretty much the only players were Maker, Aave, and Compound. But DeFi has grown beyond belief since then into a huge complex area of innovation. But does that innovation mean imminent risk? And what overall effects does it have on the market? The, the paper you're referring uh, to is, is joint work with Matthias Nadler. He's a really talented PhD student at the University of Basel. 
And uh, what we did in that paper uh, is essentially what we wanted to get two things. Number one is we wanted to see um, when you look at these tokens, governance tokens, how well distributed are they really? You know, there are all these studies where they essentially just look at the ERC-20 token contract and then they say you know, things like, okay, the, the top uh, five holders hold, uh, I don't know, like 80% of all the tokens. And uh, then they say it's heavily centralized. But when you look at it, these top five holders essentially are uh, contracts themselves. And it might be a liquidity pool where you obviously have to look at the individual holders of the liquidity pool, uh, owners of the liquidity pool, and so on. So what we did in the paper uh, as a first uh, step was uh, essentially look at the uh, reallocation of these tokens. So we started with uh, with the ERC20 token contract, the holder table, but then when, you, when the holder was another contract, then we reallocated these funds to the next level. And then there might be some other contracts, we reallocate them to the next level and so on and so on until we ended up with the real holder addresses. Um, that was the initial idea. <laughs> but then we found out that there is something much more interesting and that's uh, what you would you asked well, the question it's the rewrapping right and in economics we call that the rehypification of collateral so the idea that you have some base asset and it gets wrapped and wrapped and wrapped and wrapped again and we see something similar in defi it was just ridiculous for some of these tokens how many times they have been locked up in a contract and you have some new asset that gets issued the new asset also gets locked up in another contract and so on and so on and this uh, Heavily, I mean, it just exploded at some point. And then you had for some of these tokens average factors uh, of, of five, for example, which which means every single one of these tokens has been rewrapped five times, which is uh, well exciting, but also uh, uh, extremely um, something we should be afraid of, right? In terms of the complexity you mentioned, and I later also wrote a companion piece. Uh, for uh, Coindesk, or where I said that DeFi might not be as transparent in terms of data as we think. Yes, it's true the data is there, and that's exciting, and that's that's great. But in many cases, it's super hard to make sense of that data. Um, in many cases, you have to manually analyze these these protocols to understand where it's going, and it, it's just not it's not that easy. So uh, I think the bigger picture. Uh, the the second most exciting thing about DeFi, um, just below uh, self custodial features, which is uh, composability, uh, also has a dark side. I call, I call it the dark side of composability when things get too complex and when there is a lot of risk associated. For example, when you have the disrupting complexity where you have a token on top of a token on top of a token, it's really hard to keep track of the inherent risk. Uh, you might assume when you when you um, buy one of these tokens just because it has been rewrapped and there is, you know, some promise um, that and some dependency on another protocol, and there we have not even talked about things like like you know, oracle dependencies or the reuse of the code base. I mean, when you look at the smart contracts, and it's just ridiculous how some code snippets have been used and used and used again. In some cases, you even find comments from a completely unrelated uh, protocol and some of the devs from a completely unrelated protocol in a new one. Uh, so, uh, yeah, um, I think there is a lot of risk with, with, with composability, to be honest, and that's, that's something we certainly look into also research-wise. That's so interesting. How how um how big do you think the the problem is? Like I don't know, like this must be really hard to say, but in kind of orders of magnitude, like within the assets in in DeFi, um, like what percentage do you think has been is is kind of rewrapped tokens? Uh, I mean, in numbers, I, I really cannot say that, right? Because it also depends a lot on what exactly you count. Um, it's just one thing we can say for sure is total value locked is hugely inflated because of that. Mm -hmm. There's a false impression. But then again, we have to um, be really careful that we don't frame this as a problem that's specific to DeFi. I mean, that's something that has been going on in traditional finance for a really long time with the difference that you cannot observe it as, observe it as perfectly <laughs> in mm. traditional finance because it happens on all kinds of different ledgers and all kinds of different core banking systems and infrastructure. The difference here in DeFi, even though it might be really hard to make sense of that data, is that it's 
all there and mm-hmm. it can be analyzed by researchers like us or some, some researching companies. And th- I think that's the positive news. Uh, honestly, uh, I, I still think even though there is a lot of positive, we have to get better at analyzing this stuff. Mm. There have to be some, well, metrics except for, for TVL. There have to be some um, uh, essentially um, alert systems and observation metrics we put in place. And we have to make sure that we understand what's going on also in terms of this um, uh, interplay between these different protocols and the composability. And in many cases, that's just that's just not the case. Yeah. Do you think when a token is rewrapped five times, yeah. does that mean the like does the end asset take on the risk of like all the previous five layers? Like it takes on like five additional layers of risk, or it's not that simple? I mean, when it's locked up, right? When you when you have let's say a base asset, and then the base asset is locked in a smart contract, and the next one is a, then yeah. Um, well, in most cases, yes. It, of course, then it depends on the exact setup, right? When mm. that's one of the cases where some centralized control might actually come in handy, mm. um, because when one of these intermediate protocols um, can just, let's say, freeze the protocol or or uh, pause, um, um, uh, freeze some of the assets or pause the protocol, let's say, uh, then you may not lose it entirely. But when we assume that we are talking about statically deployed protocols, so, so true DeFi, um, then yes, of course. I mean, then you would have locked it up and locked it up and locked it up again and assume all of the risk. Uh, and in some mm-hmm. cases, if I can add something, mm-hmm. it's it's not just the, it's not just that it gets really complex when you have these tokens wrapped and wrapped again. In some cases, when you look at really complex protocols like Maker, uh, I would even go as far that mm, there aren't too many people who understand just this one protocol. I mean, mm-hmm. it's it's just in some cases absolutely ridiculous uh, when you look at the code base and the uh, abbreviations they use, the special terms they use, and the interplay between these various smart contracts it's extremely hard to understand even when you're full time in the space and when you're analyzing these contracts and that's just a single protocol. Mm. And then when you have the entire composability, then of course things get even more complex. Mm. So maybe there there should be some sort of like code standards used in DeFi every, that everyone should be using the same kind of terms for things or I don't know, because like if there's composability but everyone is using different terms then then i don't know then the code is not as composable because it doesn't kind of fit very well um with other things i mean that's it has pros and cons right um i think it would help when it's at least understandable and when it's well documented and mm-hmm. that's not always the case in many cases for DeFi protocols because they go through such rapid development cycles, uh, you will find that the documentation is outdated, uh, that it's not referencing the newest version of the protocol and so on. And I think that's probably something we can get better with. Uh, then I hope that there will be more uh, companies who provide data, and who research DeFi. Mm-hmm. And uh, I mean, that's uh, honestly, I think that's a huge business. Mm-hmm. And uh, basically analyze these different uh, protocols. And then uh, one thing uh, that's, Super annoying for researchers is that in some cases uh, the events uh, are not standardized at all and uh, are just somewhat uh, ridiculous. <laughs> uh, so when you know the, the events, essentially, it's like a lock for smart contracts. That's something you also heavily rely on in some cases for data analysis, and there are just extremely different approaches to these events. Mm-hmm. And that's something where standardization to some extent would would certainly help. Yeah, uh, it's it's I don't know. It's, it's mind blowing. It's a mind blowing space. And, and just to kind of wrap up on on that point, um, just to like bring it down the, to reality a little bit. If if you can uh, provide um, a, an example to kind of help understand why exactly are people like wrapping these tokens? Like, what's the use case for for this composability and for rewrapping uh, assets? 
Well, you can you can take a really simple example where you where you say, okay, we have all all kinds of different assets, but at the end of the day, we want to have something that resembles a mutual fund, and we want it to be represented by a single token. And then you take these different assets. Let's call them token A, token B, and token C. Um, lock them up in a smart contract, and the smart contract issues a fund token. Then you have a first first wrapping, we might call it that way. And then this fund token could be used on a, a decentralized exchange. So maybe you're providing some liquidity alongside with another token, and then you get a liquidity provision token. And with that liquidity provision token, you could, I don't know, um, maybe it's used as collateral in some other protocol or you name it. Uh, but there are really many examples of, of, of these several steps of re-wrappings uh, and uh, usually the way you represent ownership whenever you lock something up uh, in a smart contract, whenever you lock a token up a smart contract, is represented by a new token that gets issued by, by that smart contract. And that's the that's the case. Um, yeah, and, and that's what kind of makes the the space so so exciting in part right Absolutely. it's like you, you get yeah. kind of these new new types of assets that we had never seen before that represent like deposits or liquidity yeah. uh, positions uh, and then you know capital becomes really efficient because you can then use that again somewhere else but yeah as you said there's the downside is you start layering risk upon risk and um, and then who knows what a real kind of black swan event like systemic kind of i don't know like a crash looks like when everything is so tied together absolutely it's the it's the money legos right it's it's, mm. it's super exciting because people can build on other protocols but of course you're also adding dependencies when you build a protocol on top of another protocol and the same is true for these tokens yeah um Great. I think uh, we we should be wrapping up. Uh, I'd love to ask you um, our kind of uh, flagship question for the Defiant podcast, which is, uh, Fabian, what, what makes you defiant? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the interdisciplinary approach. Um, I sometimes feel a little bit like an outsider among economists. But I also feel like a, an outsider among parts of the of the crypto community, and I try to tackle from very different perspectives, and, uh, and also to to connect people. I mean, uh, you, you mentioned the BIS conference. Um, I think the great part about that conference was that you had people from central banks talking to people from the crypto space. And that's something that does not happen every every single day. And I think it's super important. And, and well, what makes me defiant? I, I, I think at the end of the day, the idea uh, that I think self-custody is the most important principle and that, that it's something I'm fighting for, uh, something I really want people to understand and also show them the, 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 the benefits of it. Awesome. I love that. Um, Fabian, uh, I know that you have some uh, kind of great resources that uh, everyone kind of listening would love to take advantage of. So uh, I, I'll let you share. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we have been offering uh, blockchain courses at the University of Boston for a really long time. And uh, we decided a little over a year ago to make it completely open access open source with a, a Creative Commons license. And you can find our uh, blockchain classes, also a specific course just on smart contract programming and uh, DeFi protocols on uh, CryptoLectures.io. And uh, as I said, it's completely uh, free of charge, no strings attached, and you can even reuse the material. That's awesome. So it's free uh, free courses on uh, on crypto blockchain defi specifically is it like yeah. programming courses or more theoretical or both both uh, awesome. for the smart contracts and decentralized finance course we start with an introduction to solidity um, we get a chance to develop your own uh, protocols but then we also tackle specific topics like decentralized exchanges like lending protocols we have a, a detailed look at tokens different kinds so it's it's really a mix of both and, and again the interdisciplinary approach between economics and computer science that sounds super interesting can you can you say the link again cryptolectures.io 
CryptoLectures.io. Um, yeah. I might uh, do some of those courses myself, so I I don't have to rely on others and can start checking on, on the smart contracts <laughs> myself. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> awesome. Fabian, thank you so much for joining me. This was amazing. Super interesting. Thank you very much for the invitation, Camila. <laughs>